Welcome to Live Label Free, the podcast where we talk about all things eating disorder recovery, autism, entrepreneurship, and so much more. I'm your host, Livia Sarah, and my mission is to inspire individuals from across the globe to live a life in which they feel fulfilled and free from limiting labels. I am so excited to have you here and cannot wait to dive into the episode. Hello, hello, my lovely listeners. I almost cannot contain my excitement because today I am chatting with Louise from at no divergent underscore Lou on Instagram. And as you will hear in the upcoming episode, Lou is such a wealth of knowledge when it comes to autism, no diversity, and breaking the stigmas around mental health. We honestly talk about so much, including what autism is, how undiagnosed autism can lead to other mental health issues, and we bust some of the most common myths and misconceptions around autism. Lou also shares her own story, not only about growing up as an autistic person in a neurotypical world, but she also shares her history with an eating disorder, and we discuss how someone can use their autistic traits as strengths in ED recovery. Lastly, we answer all of the questions from Instagram, so the questions all of you asked, including how to tell someone you're autistic, how to deal with autism imposter syndrome, so feeling like you're not autistic enough, and Lou gives some legendary relationship tips both for friendships as well as how a neurotypical person can support their autistic partner. I am absolutely certain that you will learn so much from this episode and we would both love it if you could share this episode to Instagram stories and tag both Lou at no divergent underscore Lou so that's n-e-u-r-o-d-i-v-e-r-g-e and T underscore L O U and myself at Live Label Free, like the name of this podcast. Let's spread awareness for autism acceptance together. And without further ado, let's meet Lou. Hey Lou, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. I am so excited to have you here to speak about autism and neurodivergence and invisible disabilities and all the things. So yeah, this is going to be really fun and I'm so excited. So how are you feeling today? Thank you. I'm so excited and so happy to be here. Um, Yeah, really looking forward to it. Yay, me too. Well, with you being like a total legend on Instagram when it comes to educating and advocating for breaking the stigmas around autism and neurodivergence, I find it very hard to imagine that people don't know who you are, but I guess there's a first time to meet everyone. (laughs) So for our listeners who don't know you yet or maybe aren't on Instagram as much, can you just share a bit about yourself and what you do? Thank you so much. Um, Yeah, I am a 19-year-old autistic advocate or educator, whichever term you want to use. Both. (laughs) (laughs) Both. Um, And I share I guess my life growing up as an autistic person in the neurotypical world um, and I create content about the autistic experience um, and what it means to be autistic um, from lots of different kind of perspectives Um, yeah that's amazing yeah and I think what you're doing is so important because there's so much I feel like misinformation and just lack of information out there and I think you did a post the other day about how we really need to incorporate more autistic voices in the way that autism is approached because it's so often that people who are not neurodivergent or not autistic so really ableist people are kind of being the voice for autistic people but that's not fair because they don't know what goes on in our brains so I think it's such important work that you're doing and I think I can speak on behalf of the entire autistic and neurodivergent community when I say that we are so incredibly grateful to have you so I kind of want to deep dive into how you found out you were autistic and kind of your story so can you tell us a bit about your childhood and your life growing up yeah so on my life like in my like early childhood I think the thing that stands out to me was when I started um, primary school and 
for lots of people that was quite an exciting thing but for me that was very anxiety provoking and I remember that was kind of the first time that I realized that there was something different about the way that I was compared to other people so I would for example not fit in socially into kind of the groups that everyone had or playing with people in the playground that was always quite like a difficult thing for me and I used to get really anxious about things and I do remember noticing that I was a lot more anxious than sort of the other people I was around and I also had like lots of different kind of interests at the time like I was massively obsessed with animals and in particular horses and I noticed that that was like a lot more intense I guess than other people's interests like I remember not understanding why like when I was sort of five or six why not everybody else felt the same way about horses and animals that I did so yeah that was kind of my like start of my primary school but I eventually learned to mask my autism quite a lot like people wouldn't necessarily notice and I wasn't diagnosed till a lot later even though kind of a lot of people said that they knew I was autistic but yeah I just wasn't able to be diagnosed. Oh wow so people in your community did pick it up that's so interesting. Yeah so my family kind of knew that I was autistic and they were telling people at school for example but because I was masking and because lots of my difficulties didn't necessarily show up in sort of the classroom environment they were more in the playground or I learned to kind of mask those difficulties that meant that I wasn't diagnosed until I was about 15 in the end. Wow yeah so how did it go from your parents saying like oh she's probably autistic and maybe teachers saying no she's not autistic enough you know that stereotype how did kind of that timeline go of actually being diagnosed with autism? So I was actually diagnosed after I experienced kind of burnout and um, struggled with mental health. So I ended up under the mental health services in the UK and that meant that they realised that kind of I was anxious and struggling with depression at the time. That There was actually something deeper underlying it because I'd had lots of kind of mental health issues throughout my life like it had come and gone throughout like my teenage like experience and even younger than that and it was kind of my mum pushing it and saying I would like her to be able to speak with an expert because I think oftentimes professionals just don't know what it means to be autistic and I know my mum had done quite a bit of research so yeah it ended up with them agreeing to refer me and they decided that yes like after I'd undergone the assessment yes I was autistic and that the reason it hadn't been picked up earlier was because of my masking. Yeah that's so interesting and I'm kind of curious now how did your parents kind of how were they able to recognize the signs of autism because I know from my personal experience I actually really had to start educating myself and reading books and when I started I had to almost teach my own parents what it meant to be autistic because growing up when I heard the word autism I had no idea what it meant like I thought of a male who is obsessed with math and you know really the stereotype of autism because what it means to be autistic isn't taught in schools you know it's not part of the curriculum so I'm curious how did your parents kind of know that how did they recognize the signs? So I think it was more them realising that something was different about me and then kind of researching, I think, like on the internet and things like that. And there were some kind of stereotypical kind of autistic traits that I was experiencing, like, for example, coming home from school and having like meltdowns. um, That's like quite a big autistic thing. And sort of, as I said, like my interests and I get really like overloaded sensory wise as well so there were some traits there but I do think that even when I first knew about autism I didn't see myself I saw that stereotypical depiction of what being autistic is which I think is so important to know like autistic people exist in lots of different kind of ways like we're not all just one stereotype. Yeah, it it doesn't have a look. (laughs) And I think when you mentioned about like other mental health issues that so common when especially when autism goes undiagnosed, because we almost find other ways to cope because we don't know what is quote unquote wrong with us. So yeah, I just think that's so important. And that's amazing that your parents really did that research. Because again, from my personal experience, like looking back at like all the 
weird quote unquote things I did, like only drawing symmetrical things and in school, like always needing to follow routine, becoming super obsessed with toy collections, but then never actually playing with them. Like looking back, my parents are like, we saw that and we thought it was weird, but we thought it just made you unique. <laughs> and it, it does, you know, but it's really just nice to know kind of the why behind it because it allows you to, especially as you get older, really build your life in a way that works for you and really realize that you don't have to fit the mold that society kind of creates for us. So thank you so much for sharing your story with us. I think it's always so great to hear other autistics stories. So even with like your story, sharing your story and all the valuable content you share on your Instagram, I think there is kind of always this confusion about like what exactly autism is like as we just mentioned we talked about the stereotype some people will say like also autism spectrum disorder so like asd while a lot of what me and you preach is that it's a disability so i think semantics are also a huge part of this conversation and for our listeners who maybe are kind of exploring whether they may be on the spectrum or just are kind of new to the whole autism neurodivergent world can you give our listeners kind of what is autism in a nutshell? Yeah, so autism is a neurodevelopmental disability and it means that autistic people might struggle with things like communicating with other neurotypical people, um, following kind of society's rules, especially the ones that don't seem logical. Autistic people also kind of struggle often with sensory things. So that might be like sound or light or colors textures and like touch and things like that and also kind of autistic people tend to have like strong interests that they pursue and I guess when I describe that it's like having an interest where nothing else matters apart from that one thing yeah and it's always seems to be to me like a lot more intense than what I notice from like neurotypical people yeah autistic people also like kind of routine and there's like a tendency to enjoy kind of following a routine it helps to give us predictability and in a world that can be quite chaotic because we're living in a world that's like not built for us and and that's kind of what comes with the disability so it tends to be kind of medical professionals call it autism spectrum disorder although to me I prefer to call it a disability because I'm disabled by a society that is not built for autistic people it's built for neurotypical people and that's why I say my autism disables me but equally at the same time I think disability isn't a bad word and that's really important as well like I think sometimes people say to me but you like being autistic so how is it a disability and I think both those things can be true at once I can be autistic and be happy and not want to change the fact that I'm autistic but also find it kind of disabling living in this world that isn't accommodating in a way Yeah, no, you worded it honestly so perfectly. And I think now hearing you speak about it in terms of semantics, I think something that a lot of autistic people have in common, and of course not all, is this really importance of how things are phrased and how things are worded. And I know that growing up, that was one of those things that my parents were always like, thought that made me weird because I would always be so particular about how things were said. And I think that also contributes to that um, like literal thinking because a lot of autistic people take things very literally. So sarcasm can be super difficult because if you take a sarcastic joke literally, (laughs) then it kind of totally defeats the purpose. So yeah, what you said about like disability and I get that it's like it disables us in the neurotypical world, but in our own world, it almost ables us to thrive, if that makes sense. So it's really the same with like the disorder thing, like I guess it could be a disorder if you're trying to achieve like a neurotypical way of living, like it's not in order (laughs) with the neurotypical lifestyle, but we could almost say the same about neurotypical people, like their way of living is disordered from like how we live, like they make way too much eye contact and they're not sensitive enough, you know, there's always two ways of looking at everything. Um, So I think it's so important to really distinguish between the semantics and that we really have to stop seeing disabilities as a bad thing because they're not like people only see them as bad because maybe they're not as common as what society has created. But yeah, (laughs) honestly, I could just go on and on about this forever. Um, But I do have one question because I get a lot of questions on my Instagram about this idea of hypo versus versus hypo sensitivity, because I'm personally a very 
hypersensitive person in some areas of life, but in other areas of life, I'm hyposensitive. So can you kind of explain the difference and when someone may be hyper or hyposensitive? Yeah, so someone who's hypersensitive in terms of like their sensory system might find that they're really like find noise really overwhelming, find textures really difficult um, and are oversensitive to these things or find colours overwhelming. Like it can be a variety of different things. Whereas someone who's hyposensitive, like they kind of find themselves in need of like a weighted blanket, kind of that sensory pressure or they find that they can't like, they're not as sensitive to other things so like fabrics they'll find like they kind of prefer heavier fabrics like to wear um so they're kind of less sensitive to like sensory input interesting yeah so do you think that someone can be both at the same time yeah definitely like I know for example that sometimes like definitely depends on my mood like sometimes I'll be like really in need of kind of that pressure or feeling kind of like hyposensitive and then other times I'll be feeling hypersensitive so yeah they definitely like definitely depends um and you can be both yeah I'm really glad you mentioned that because in the beginning I was like when I was still finding out about everything and I mean I still am I'm learning (laughs) from your account every single day it's fascinating um I was like I thought I was hypersensitive but for this thing I need like extra stimulus so this doesn't make any sense like which one am I I'm probably not even autistic like what else is going on you know so it's really I think good to know for people listening that it really is a spectrum in every sense of the word because for some things like maybe I like I do a lot of with food because like eating this sort of recovery I think especially in terms of food like sometimes I am super sensitive and I especially when I'm stressed, like I cannot handle foods that can like maybe irritate my gut. I need like very bland food. But then other times I'm like, no, I need something really spicy, you know, (laughs) and then I have like a really good tolerance for that. So I think it really um, depends on our mood and the way we feel because our minds and our bodies are just so interconnected more than I think science can even prove. It's still so fascinating to me how We literally have like neuroreceptors in our stomach so that when we're anxious and we start eating, we might feel nauseous or we might feel sick because our brain is so connected to our gut. Our gut is not called our second brain for nothing. So just find that so fascinating. Do you want to know what my number one secret ingredient is to creating the thickest smoothie bowls, the creamiest oat bowls, and honestly just making everything taste better? all while supporting my gut health at the same time? I know you do. Well, my friend, that ingredient is Newfest Clean Lean Protein, baby. And for those of you who do already follow me on Instagram, this may not even be a secret because I've been using Newfest for over five years now, and I'm about to tell you just why it's literally the best protein ever. So, Newfest has succeeded in creating a plant based protein that's made from only the highest quality ingredients, has the smoothest texture, and tastes absolutely amazing. They have an incredible range of flavors each of which has pea protein as the core ingredient. And not just any pea protein, get this. Pea protein made from premium European golden peas that have been grown in the rich soils of northern France and processed in Belgium using a patented water-based technique that results in a silky smooth texture. Like, does that just sound magical or what? Clean Lean Protein by Newsest is free of all common allergens such as gluten, soy, and dairy, and also contains zero artificial flavors, sweeteners, or additives. And did I mention it tastes absolutely delicious? Whether you follow a plant-based diet, love being active, struggle with gut health, or just want to improve your overall quality of life, Newsest Clean Lean Protein is a must-have in your kitchen. And when it comes to flavors, I find it so hard to choose. But my personal favorites are the Just Natural, the Smooth Vanilla, the Rich Chocolate, and the Chai, Turmeric, and Maca. And when I'm needing a little extra gut support, my go-to flavors are the Probiotic Vanilla and the Probiotic Cacao, 
that have added probiotics for optimal digestion. I am so excited to be giving my podcast listeners an exclusive 25% off when you use my code LIVEFREE25 at checkout on Newsest USA's website. So that's N U Z E S T U S A dot com and use my code LIVEFREE25 at checkout. So that's L I V F R E E. Two five to receive 25% off New Zest Clean Lean Protein. Now, let's get back to the episode. I also have one more question regarding kind of what autism is. Can you kind of explain stimming for our listeners? Because I know that that can be an interesting one because there are so many different ways in which people stim, I guess. Yeah, so stimming is like a repetitive movement that autistic people do for a variety of different reasons so stimming might be like flapping your hands or twirling your hair or blinking or rocking it can be so many different things and it stimming like has lots of different purposes but it can kind of help autistic people to feel kind of grounded in like where they are um it can help us communicate things and express our emotions it can help us with sensory like uh, regulating our sensory like systems and yeah it can just kind of it can be fun as well like I think that's another thing people forget like stimming is fun and it can be joyful yeah it's comforting Uh, yeah it can be really helpful and really good way for autistic people to cope and I think there are lots of kind of myths around like autistic stimming so sometimes people assume that autistic people shouldn't stim and they should kind of like stop an autistic person from stimming when actually kind of what autistic adults are kind of saying is you know if a stim isn't harmful that can actually be a really helpful coping mechanism it can help to regulate and cope with you know as I said earlier a world that isn't built for autistic people in mind so yeah stimming is can be a really like helpful tool with coping Yeah, so I love that you said like that you mentioned myths and misconceptions, because that's definitely something I want to get into because there's obviously so many. But before I do that, I wanted to ask about uh, a common myth about stimming that I've kind of discovered and was just thinking about myself was I think there's this huge myth about stimming that it has to be like one of these typical well not typical obviously because we're talking about autism um but one of these like typical autism stims like you said like hand flapping or rocking or twirling your hair or blinking like are there any kind of maybe non-traditional stims I don't know if that's a weird question but like stims that almost people would question whether it would be stimming or not yeah like there definitely are like I think often with masking as well like autistic people learn to stim in ways that aren't going to attract attention so for example like nail biting like I know that can be a stim for some people like I used to kind of twirl my hair in a way that wasn't obvious or touch my hair um, as a way to kind of regulate myself I think even just like tapping your fingers like on a desk I've seen like neurotypical people do that as well that can be a way for autistic people to stim yeah, because when neurotypical people do it too, then you almost start to question, like, maybe I'm not stimming, like, but I think what the most important thing that you said in the beginning, really the core at it was making ourselves feel comfortable. Like, if that's kind of the purpose of the behavior, then I guess it could be called stimming, because another example that I just thought of is for me, like, if I'm in public and I don't want to, like, cause a scene, I will, like, count stuff in my head. So if I am outside, I will, like, look at the car license plates and like be like which ones say California and which ones are from another state and I would become hyper focused on that almost to distract myself from the anxiety I feel in that situation I think it's just such an important reminder that anything can be a stim and like just because you don't fit into the autistic mold or any mold that society has kind of created or that we think society has created you are like valid and your thoughts are valid and your actions are valid. I think validity is really at the core of all of this. So now I would like to get into some more like common myths and misconceptions around autism. So what are some of the most common myths and misconceptions you've seen or maybe got questions about on Instagram? I think one of the most common ones I get is autism ends at 18 and I think lots of people assume that 
you know autism is something that only children have and once you turn 18 you magically kind of are not autistic anymore and I think that's down to a lot of the kind of media portrayals of autism tends to be focused on children and I think it is actually quite a dangerous myth because currently I think the myth is there so and it means that there are no services for adults because there's like you know very little services at least because people think that autistic people don't exist after 18 and I think you know even facing kind of misconceptions in like the workplace or at university because you're an adult who's autistic um, and people see it as something only children have yeah wow that's I've, I've actually never heard that like autism stops at 18 like I've definitely heard that like adults are less likely to have autism than children but I'm like that doesn't make any sense because every adult was once a child like it would almost be more the other way around um because not every child has been an adult well I'm sorry that's like really confusing but that's really such an important point you bring up especially for like the workplace in school because I know for me school growing up was just so difficult especially I feel like with autism it's really hard to focus or do or concentrate on anything that we're not like actually genuinely interested in so for me I was I felt like I was always dragging myself through classes if the subject did not interest me but then if it was something that I was passionate about then I excelled at it you know and in the workplace too like there's not really any space to deviate, I guess, because the typical work is like a nine to five job. But in general, for an autistic person, I feel like if it's not something you're super interested and super passionate about, that is like honestly way too long of a time to like either sit still or have to be social or have to sit behind a computer screen. And that can just, again, like we mentioned before, cause so many other mental health issues like depression and anxiety and especially maybe social anxiety burnout yeah so I'm curious now how do you think that we can kind of break this myth besides like spreading awareness on Instagram and um, how do you think we can bring it into the world and improve the healthcare system to accommodate like older people on the spectrum yeah I think it starts with kind of people knowing that we exist so Instagram's a good tool and I think I'd love to see mainstream media cover it a bit more as well. Like I know I hear very little on the news, for example, about autistic adults or autistic like elderly people as well. Like that's a massive group missed out. Um, But I do hear quite a lot about autistic children on like TV shows, like breakfast shows, for example. I'd love to see that kind of be portrayed as well as in kind of films as well, like love to see autistic adults shown you know authentically I think also it's about like policy change and about like setting up support for autistic adults ideally led by autistic people like themselves I think that would be a really good place to start in like breaking down the myths I think yeah it'd be good to see like this like support being put in place I think that would be really helpful in kind of breaking down that those myths and difficulties. Yeah, no, I love that. And I I obviously am not going to name any names when it comes to like autism therapy and that kind of stuff. Um, but you're so right. Like we really just need more autistic voices in the space because I feel like people that are not autistic assume that we are like incapable of leading anything like somehow. Um, so we're not able to do that but we are more able than them to (laughs) talk about something that we know more about so yeah and also what you said about like mainstream media and tv and um movies and that kind of stuff something that i've seen like in almost every kind of autistic kind of media portrayal is that it's a non-autistic actor so no typical actor is playing the role of an autistic person and it's completely like often really portraying the stigma of what a typical autistic person is supposed to look like. And then when you read the interviews, it's like, how do you know that this is what an autistic person is like? It's like, I did my research. (laughs) And I'm like, well, no amount of research can encompass at how an autistic brain thinks. And yeah, just so frustrating. So I really think that it starts with awareness, like you said, and we're doing what we can to spread awareness. And yeah, I obviously also spread a lot of awareness around 
autism and eating disorders. And I know you have your own experience with an eating disorder. So will you feel comfortable kind of sharing a bit about that? Yeah, so I started struggling when I was in my kind of teen, early teenage years. And I think like for a lot of autistic people, I was struggling socially and fitting in. And I didn't have a special interest at the time. Um, things were difficult. I didn't really understand my autistic identity and I kind of turned to food as like a way to cope with that and it kind of became an obsession and like a way like for me to distract my brain from all the difficulties and I think I felt like if I kind of followed what my eating disorder wanted then I would be more liked by other people and be more kind of socially acceptable because I guess that's what we are kind of always told and sort of pushed by like the media and stuff like that I think it is really important to recognize that as well I think yeah it was like a quite a vulnerable time period as an autistic person sort of in those teenage years it definitely became an obsession for me and I think the fact that I already struggled with like sensory textures of food and routine and then also then I was experiencing different emotions and I didn't quite have the coping skills to like understand those different emotions I think also the fact that can be quite like very absorbing of yourself especially if you don't have much identity already because I wasn't really sure who I was so yeah like it was quite a difficult time and were you diagnosed with autism at this point yet or not yet no I wasn't diagnosed with autism until after like a long time well not a long time but a few years afterwards Wow, I think almost the un, like the not yet being diagnosed can really contribute to disordered eating because you don't know kind of what the root cause is, if that makes sense. Um, because for me now, looking back, like I was diagnosed with an eating disorder when I was 11 and only was diagnosed with autism literally a decade later. And looking back, I think throughout the course of my treatment and how kind of my eating disorder was handled, I guess, if we would have known that I was autistic, I think... Just like with the awareness, like we just mentioned, I think it really would have made a difference in the way of my recovery because it was often like, she's too obsessed with this. Like we need to get rid of the obsession or they were trying to almost looking back, get rid of the autistic characteristics. But I'm like, I still have those. It was just, we had to separate them from the food. So we had to separate them from the actual disorder. And again, that's another really important point is that um, an eating disorder is like a disorder and because a disorder is something you can get rid of. And autism is a disability, like we say, so you can't get rid of it. So I think especially when it comes to like co-occurring mental health issues, I always think it's so important to distinguish between um, you can't get rid of the autism, but you can kind of use it to your advantage almost to get rid of the other disorder so with that said I wanted to ask because I realized I jumped are there any other common myths and misconceptions you wanted to share I think the one about you don't look autistic I think that's a big one I'm constantly being told that when I say I'm autistic and I understand because it comes from a place of not knowing it like I don't think that ever comes from a place of harm I think it's just like genuine like people not understanding but autism has no look all different types of people are autistic and sometimes autistic people mask as well and that means that they kind of hide their autistic traits and kind of mimic neurotypical traits from other people so that they don't appear as autistic because often we're taught that unconsciously we sort of learn that being autistic doesn't get like what we need or what we want so yeah we mask so that makes it even more difficult for people to tell if other people are autistic so I always think well no I don't look autistic because I've spent half my life pretending to be neurotypical but yeah autism doesn't have a look at all yeah and I honestly wonder where that whole idea came from of like autism having a look because if you think about neurotypical people like they don't have a look either (laughs) and and then also same with like the special interest thing like when someone is has a hobby and they become like really passionate about it it's just a hobby or a passion but then if an autistic person has this hobby or passion it's immediately like a special interest or a strange thing to do and I'm like why like where did that come from so again it's just the way we speak about it I think is so important and just really needs to shift so is there another myth or misconception you'd like to bust 
Um, I think the fact that autism can be cured, I think that's another really harmful one. Oh, yeah. There is no cure for autism. And even if there was a cure, I think quite a few autistic people wouldn't want that cure because autism makes up our whole kind of brain. There's no way to separate ourselves from being autistic. It's part of who we are and we wouldn't be who we are without being autistic. So I think that's a really important one. I think sometimes people say that their child or whoever has become less autistic. Sometimes that makes me think, well, they've just learned to mask their autistic traits, especially if they're in a difficult environment. So yeah, autism does not have a cure. It's um, lifelong. Yeah, so what you just said about like their child has become less autistic, I'm almost like, that's a bad sign <laughs> because it means they're probably feeling more tired and more drained and like they can't be themselves. So now, because we did talk about your eating disorder, I thought a really important question is, and especially what, what you said, about like the cure thing too when it comes to an eating disorder I feel like it cannot necessarily be cured like here's your medication like oh gone um but you can definitely get rid of an eating disorder or at least have it not be prominent part of your life or dominant part of your life whereas with autism like it's who we are it's everything we do is autistic every action kind of our look on the world is autistic so because this disorder and disability often are so co-occurring do you think it's harder for an autistic person to recover from an eating disorder or any other mental illness I guess yeah so I'm recovered from my eating disorder and I think that although it would always be in the back of my mind or kind of when things when I struggle it will always kind of be in the back of my mind like I think it is 100% possible for an autistic person to recover. I think that sometimes there's a myth or misconception, or there's another one, um, that autistic people should just be expected to live with eating disorders or mental illness and that it's part of being autistic. And we should just kind of take it as part and parcel. But no, autistic people definitely deserve, with the right support and the right help, to live a like a fulfilled and happy life without being kind of plagued by sort of an eating disorder. Like autism can be used to your strengths as well, I think. That's another thing that I didn't really learn about in my recovery until I found the autistic community. I think if you really like routines, you can make food like part of a healthy routine for you and, you know, use it to like help kind of regulate your sensory system. Like I have like ice lollies that I find really helpful for me to kind of eat when I'm feeling like like really hot or really flustered. Um, So, yeah, like working to my advantages and. I think also it does give autistic people sometimes tend to have like a particular drive so like for me when I get really motivated there's kind of nothing stopping me so with my eating disorder I became really motivated to kind of live my life how I wanted to and I think that was a massive part for me in kind of coping and learning to live my life was that drive that I had and kind of that kind of push of I don't want the rest of my life to look like this so yeah that that definitely helped and being autistic can help you in your recovery if you use it kind of to help you oh my goodness my heart is honestly so (laughs) filled right now because I'm like you just hit the nail on the head and just your words I could not have said it any better you said it so well with when it comes to really using those autistic traits to your advantage because I think it's often really part of that misconception that because autism is a disability that we are less capable of doing things or doing hard things I guess so when it comes to recovery from an eating disorder which by the way I'm so happy that you said you're recovered because I can say I'm recovered too so for anyone who's autistic who's struggling with an eating disorder you have two examples that it is 100% possible to recover and yeah because like the autistic traits that almost got us into the eating disorder like the routine and the obsessiveness and really the eating disorder used them kind of to its advantage and I actually did a very recent podcast episode on seeing the eating disorder as a parasite or like a virus that it almost uses the person as its host to kind of ingrain itself and then multiply and spread exponentially but when you are able to use those very same traits so this like work ethic and this persistence and just wanting to do everything really well and not stopping until you've achieved your goal like if you use that in recovery it can be such an amazing thing and I think how we mentioned about how there's always two ways to look at something like two sides to a coin it's the same with like your traits and your autistic traits because 
we could see them as a negative thing if we're using them in the wrong ways, if that makes sense. But if we kind of unleash them into something bigger than us or something we want to achieve and we say, we're going to use our routine and our very hard workingness and our perfectionism to achieve this goal, then we can create such amazing things. And I think that's also when when you even look at history, there's so many scientists and just legends in history that were autistic like we would not have the laws of physics that we have today if it weren't for autistic people so I think that's always something so important to remember is that you can look at autism as a bad thing but at the same time it can also be the most amazing thing ever it's really shifting that narrative so really really love that and I love that we were able to connect it to eating disorders Are you currently experiencing extreme hunger and do you fear that you're becoming a binge eater? Or perhaps you are constantly thinking of ways to deserve food or make up for it. Or you just feel overridden with gut-wrenching guilt every time you eat something unplanned or miss a workout. If any of that resonates, you are in luck because I am interrupting my very own episode to tell you about my one-on-one coaching program. One of my favorite quotes is that your mess will become your message and my coaching program was really born out of that. I created this program after being told that I was a hopeless case by a clinical psychiatrist over six years ago. I thought there was something wrong with me and that I was simply uncurable, but I quickly learned that I wasn't the only one being pushed aside by their doctors and healthcare providers. It was the system that was failing patients, not to mention how most treatment centers or insurance companies only support those who fit the eating disorder stereotypes. As the years went on and I finally dug myself out of the deep hole the eating disorder had created for me, I continued to hear horror story after horror story from clients being disregarded and being labeled as too complex by the so-called professionals. In the traditional healthcare system, it really is unfortunate that you fall between land and ship when you're dealing with more than one mental health issue and you're often told to first quote-unquote fix the other issues before they can help you with tackling your eating disorder. But it does not work like that. An eating disorder never stands alone, so why should you? My promise when it comes to coaching is to guide you on the path to freedom, whatever that looks like for you. You don't need to fit a stereotype or be at a low weight or even feel sick enough to get help. In fact, if any part of your life is compromised by disordered eating, you are sick enough and have every right to help. Whatever you're going through right now, please know that you are never alone. And I am so open to exploring how we can find freedom for you together. I have stood in your shoes and am so incredibly passionate about the power of lived experience. I thought that I was never going to get better. Yet here I am, thriving. And if I can do it, so can you. During our time together, we will approach your recovery holistically. We'll explore what's holding you back, discover what you need, and unlock your full potential because you are so beautiful and unique, my friend. You can schedule a free 30-minute discovery call with me at livelabelfree.com forward slash schedule. That's live label free like the name of this podcast dot com forward slash schedule so that's s-c-h-e-d-u-l-e i absolutely cannot wait to chat now let's get back to the episode so before we wrap up i wanted to get into some of the listener questions that i got on instagram so there were honestly a lot of them but several did have like similar main topics or main ideas so let's just dive right in so do you ever second guess whether you are really autistic or if you're autistic enough yeah I definitely like that is definitely something I've kind of battled with over the years I think it came for me it came from like different places so the fact that everybody who is portrayed as autistic like in films and whatever like wherever else you hear about autistic people is always a stereotype and I never recognized myself in that so I never saw myself 
as autistic and I think the other thing for me is the fact that I masked my traits so I didn't necessarily appear kind of outwardly you know the definition of an autistic person because I learned to mask some of those things so I think those two things definitely made me feel kind of like struggling with feeling like I wasn't autistic I think what helped me with that was learning from other autistic people's experiences especially on Instagram and more recently like TikTok and YouTube and there is so many different platforms um, to learn about being autistic. I think that there's so many different types of autistic people that exist as well. And I guess the other thing that like helped me was knowing that every autistic person was different. Um, you know, everyone has different traits. And I guess that wasn't something I necessarily understood to start with. I thought, you know, autistic people all have the same traits. Whereas, you know, like you said earlier, it was, it's a spectrum and everyone has different traits and different like levels of different traits and and then the other thing I kind of think about is neurotypical people don't spend their whole lives feeling as though they might be autistic I feel like it's not very common for neurotypical people to you know spend a lot of time thinking I'm autistic and mainly autistic people think they're autistic I think you know following your intuition and your like what your gut is telling you I guess if you feel you're autistic and you've sort of done lots of research into it being comfortable with that identity in yourself yeah I love that it's almost like autism imposter syndrome like I'm not allowed to be autistic or I'm not allowed to be part of this community I feel like it very closely ties to again this eating disorder idea of when we feel we're not sick enough because we're maybe not at a low enough weight and that again has to do with society because like insurance companies and treatment centers will often only accept eating disorder patients if they do meet this physical criteria but it's like you said like a person that was not sick enough would not question whether they would be sick enough so I think the way you said that is just beautiful because like of course like if if you're not autistic like you wouldn't question whether you're autistic so I think that's almost the best permission slip to autistic people thinking they may be autistic to kind of allow themselves to be autistic and again that it doesn't have a look just like an eating disorder doesn't have a look being sick enough doesn't have a look being autistic doesn't have a look and honestly neurotypicality doesn't have a look either like no one has a look because everyone is themselves unless you're an identical twin (laughs) Um, and even then you're different so um, I think it's just what is at the core of everything and the root of everything is really accepting diversity and accepting that everyone is different and we don't all have to be the same so with that said how do you kind of tell people you're autistic if you do find out or self-diagnose or eventually diagnose how do you kind of share that with the world and share that with loved ones yeah so I guess I've kind of built up a formula almost in doing this in my mind it's very autistic that's tough (laughs) I guess I usually start by thinking about like whether I want to tell the person I'm autistic and kind of almost do a like a yes like uh, advantages of that and then like disadvantages of that like that helps me and then once I've decided that I want to tell them I sometimes would like think about you know is it a good time for this person like are they really busy or rushed around because if they are they're not going to be able to focus on what I'm saying sometimes I might you know message them and say oh I've got something to tell you about me it's nothing to worry about but something I just want to share so that they kind of know in advance that you know you want to have a conversation with them I've learned that I need to say to people that it's nothing to worry about because otherwise they will worry so yeah and then I guess I usually start kind of talking about the strengths being autistic gives me and like if they've noticed any of these things so I might talk about how it gives me kind of like a lot of passion and it makes me really like hyper focused on the things I'm interested in Um, it helps me understand some people better and then I also might say like how it affects me and how I struggle as a result of being autistic so yeah that's what I normally kind of start with sharing and then you know just let the conversation lead from there like I might you know if there's something specific I need them to do like if I have a meltdown I might share that with them or yeah sometimes I shared like some good resources of like where to find out more as well so those things have kind of definitely been helpful when sharing with someone that I'm autistic I absolutely love that and I love that you made a math formula (laughs) well not a math (laughs) but a, a formula out of it because I think as an autistic person who is showing that they're autistic like a formula is 
our best way to do it because it's structured and it's routine and <laughs> takes away that extra thinking piece of the social aspect too. So with that said, do you have any tips for how you can make friends or have a social life as an autistic person? Um, I think there are a few things with this. So I tend to gravitate towards like neurodivergent people and other autistic people with a lot of people I was friends with in my life. I've just kind of realised, oh, this person's autistic too, or, you know, they tell me they're autistic and I've just kind of gravitated towards them. But so, yeah, that can be really helpful because I think there's a mutual understanding and like comfort between autistic people. I think we can understand each other better and communicate better understand like sensory needs for example I think also when communicating or talking with other people trying to make friends I think it can be really helpful to like set yourself boundaries so knowing you know I'm gonna go and meet this person and afterwards I'm gonna do these things to help me calm down um, and like regulate myself so I think socializing can be really tough for autistic people I think it's also good to kind of meet people through like shared interests like if so a lot of my friends that I have I've kind of met through some of the volunteering work I've done which is you know really important to me and like has been like part of a special interest so I think it is really important to kind of meet people that you have something in common with it can be helpful to think about what you will want to talk about with this person like So I might think of, oh, like some topics that, you know, we have in common or something I want to know about them. Yeah, so that those things can kind of help you feel more prepared when you're meeting someone and wanting to kind of build friendships. I love that. Yeah. And I'm definitely actually going to use those tips myself because making friends as an autistic person is definitely something I've struggled with myself. And what you said about boundaries, I think is so, so huge too, because There have been some times with me where I've been like, oh, I'm going to just meet this new person. And as soon as I get back, I'm going to write a blog post. And then I come back and I just am so almost paralyzed from unconsciously masking, I guess. Because even when you say like, I'm going to be my authentic self, like as humans, we, we want other people to like us. So the masking, I think, is something that unless you really know that person like super well, like. I feel like even with my own family, sometimes I mask. (laughs) So I think it's really important to allow yourself and give yourself grace when it comes to being social too. Like after you've done that or before you are social to just allow yourself to be and relax and not stress about it because ultimately it, it is, it can be exhausting for us. So kind of diving deeper into the social life and making friends, I wanted to ask about autism and relationships and for all the neurotypical people out there, they asked, how can you support an autistic partner? Um, I think with this one, I think it's about just having that communication, like sort of communicating things bluntly when you want to share something, because I think for me as an autistic person, it can be very hard for me to like cope what they're saying um, and understand what they're actually trying to say. I think also it's just like letting them know that you are supportive of them and you you are trying to understand their autistic identity. I know that for me, like in friendships and things, I like, have said, oh, I've learned about what being autistic means from people on Instagram or on TikTok or places like that. And I think that always means a lot to autistic people, I guess. Also just kind of asking us if there's anything that we want you to do. I guess some people might like want someone to have an end time to like a date or when you're meeting someone I think that can be helpful or having like a kind of way to say to that person like a code word for example that they want to get out of the situation or you know if I have a meltdown you know this is what I want you to do I think having someone that you know is open to helping you I think that can be really important as well if you're supporting an autistic partner. Yeah, I love that so much again. And it again comes down to the root of like accommodating and really understanding each other's differences and accepting the diversity. And of course, it can be hard as an autistic person to kind of find your soulmate. But in Holland, we have an expression that for every pot, there exists a lid. So if anyone's like hopeless about ever finding someone, know that there is someone out there for you so with that said do you have anything else you wanted to say before we wrap up um I just want to thank you so much for having me like it's been so nice to chat and 
you know so grateful that you invited me on it's so nice to be on your podcast Oh my goodness. I am absolutely honored that you said yes and you on you and that we're talking because you are seriously such a role model. And like I said, you are a legend. <laughs> so thank you so much for sharing all your expertise and all your tips and all your amazing wisdom and insight. I'm sure that my listeners are so grateful for you. All right. Bye. Bye. Wow. I just do not have words. Was that just not the most incredible conversation? I mean, Lou is just such a beautiful person, and it was such a pleasure speaking with her. Lou and I would both love to hear what you thought of this episode, so please screenshot you listening and share it to your IG stories, and tag both me at LiveLabelFree and Lou at NoDivergent underscore Lou, and tell us your thoughts. Tell us what inspired you most. What takeaways do you have? We cannot wait to hear from you and break the stigmas around mental health as a team. Now, goodbye, friend. I will catch you in the next episode.